Hi guys, this is uh, going to be a very quick set of slides on the overview, basically an overview of the ideas of chapter 10. I'm going to try to cook up some additional slides which will be sort of homework style problems kind of worked out. If I have time, I will do that. So here we go. Let's talk about chapter 10. It's all about collisions, stuff crashing into other stuff. And uh, the main thing is we're going to make an approximation in this chapter that's actually very good under most circumstances, and that is that when objects collide, they interact with short-range forces that are only active for a very short period of time during the collision. That has some consequences. Among them are that the total momentum of both objects taken together is unchanged during the collision. It also means that uh, while the translational kinetic energy may or may not be unchanged, the total energy is unchanged. And if you look at the collision from the center of mass point of view, it turns out in many situations it simplifies the analysis. So those are the main points. Uh, by the way, those situations in which the translational kinetic energy is unchanged are a special class of collisions, which we call elastic. Those in which the translational kinetic energy is not unchanged are called inelastic. And we'll see how that works here in a little bit. One of the consequences of this is that uh, you can neglect external forces, e forces that act on the system due to the interaction with the surroundings can be neglected during a collision because the time period is, uh, is so short. The forces that are large are the action and reaction forces between uh, components of the system. So I'm thinking of the system as all the objects that are colliding. Under normal circumstances, that's two objects that collide with one another. The forces between the two objects are much, much larger than any forces from the surroundings act or acting on either of the objects. And so we can basically neglect the surrounding forces and only worry about the action-reaction pairs. But you know, the momentum principle says that the change in the momentum of the system is equal to the net force acting on the system times the change in time. Well, the change in time is very small. And the net force is only due to the surroundings. Because if you think about it, the reciprocity forces internal to the system uh, have a special property. So one, one idea is wh why don't the action and reaction forces contribute to the net force? You ought to know that off the top of your head. But uh, I want you to think about it. If you can't figure it out, then ask me. But uh, I'm hoping that you're saying, well, of course they don't contribute because blah, right? OK, very good. OK, so let's do an example that illustrates the magnitude of these forces. Basically, this is just a ball dropping, hitting the floor, and bouncing up. It's a 100-gram ball. It strikes the floor at a speed of 6 meters per second with a momentum pointing down. It rebounds with a speed of 5 meters per second with momentum pointing up. And all I want to do is figure out uh, what's its rate of change of momentum, or what's the change in momentum um, per unit time, notice that the collision with the floor only takes one millisecond, so it's very tiny. What's the change in momentum? Well, it's the mass times the change in the y component of velocity. Only the y component of momentum changes, so I only have to worry about the y component of velocity. Turns out it's plus 5 minus negative 6 times 0.1 kilograms. It works out to be 1.1 kilogram meters per second. Doesn't sound too dramatic. But then when you figure out what is the rate of change in momentum, how much does the momentum change per unit time, you get a factor of 1,000 because of the one millisecond interaction time. And so the force of the floor pushing up on the ball is something on the order of 1,100 newtons. Now the weight of the ball, the force of the Earth acting on the ball, is only one newton. So compared to the uh, force of the collision between the floor and the ball, the weight is relatively negligible. And that's uh, especially for a short period of time. Of course, the weight continues to act over a long period of time. The force of the floor only acts for a millisecond. So if you only take into account that brief period of time between before the collision and after the collision, the force of the floor, or the force of the Earth pulling down, in other words, the weight of the ball, is completely negligible. That's the idea. Now. Uh, if you think of the system as the two objects that are colliding with each other as the total system, the momentum of the entire system is unchanged. That just means that 
the net force times delta t is going to be negligibly small because the internal forces don't contribute to the net force and the external forces times this little change in time don't significantly change the total momentum. That's the idea. Why is that useful? It's useful because if you add up the momentum of all the objects before the collision, you get the same thing as you get when you add up the momentum of all the objects in the collision after. Again, usually all the objects is two, because normally only two objects are involved in a collision. Although there's no, in principle, there's no restriction, uh, often we'll find that it's two objects. And uh, this also works both in one-dimensional collisions and two- and three-dimensional collisions. The other thing is, what about the energy principle? The energy principle says the change in the energy of the system is the work done on the system by the surroundings plus the heat transferred into the system due to a temperature difference. But because the collision is very brief, there's no time for stuff to move around and therefore there's no time to do any work. It takes time to transfer thermal energy and if a collision is very brief, there's no time for that to happen. So the idea is that in a collision, if you just look at the moment before the collision and the moment after the collision, it is extremely good approximation to say that the total energy of the system, both translational and internal, is unchanged during the collision. So that means the energy before, the total energy before, and the total energy after are equal. That's the idea. If, uh, if it turns out the translational kinetic energy is the same before and after, then we call that collision elastic. So collisions that produce no change in the internal energy, in other words, in which the translational kinetic energy is unchanged, are called elastic. Inelastic collisions do produce changes in internal energy, and totally inelastic collisions produce the maximum possible change in internal energy. Uh, and those are collisions in which the two objects colliding with one another actually end up sticking together. That's a totally inelastic collision. And let's look at an example. Let's say we have uh, an object moving to the right with the speed v1 and the second object, m2, is initially at rest. If they are involved in an inelastic collision, it means the two objects actually stick together. Because they stick together, it means their final velocities have to be equal. And all we have to do then is write down the fact that the momentum before and the momentum after have to be equal. If I put in an expression for the momentum before, which is just m1 v1 initial, and set that equal to the momentum after, which is m1 plus m2 times v final, I get that v final is m1 divided by the sum of the masses times the initial velocity of mass 1. That's simply demanding that the total momentum of the two block system is the same before and after the collision. Easily enough. Let's look at a, uh, an elastic collision. This one I'm going to assume is perfectly elastic and that means that the translational kinetic energy is unchanged by the collision. Again we have a mass m1 colliding with a mass m2 with an initial speed v1 initial. In order to be in a totally or completely perfectly elastic collision, it turns out both the masses have to have a speed afterwards. They cannot stick together. Um, and so we have v1 final and v2 final, two different velocities after the collision. We simply put in the fact that the momentum has to be the same before and after, and that the translational kinetic energies have to be the same before and after. And then we, we've got two equations, and we've got two unknowns, the, the final velocity of mass 1 and the final velocity of mass 2. If you plug all that in, you get two results. You get the final velocity of mass 1 is the difference of the masses divided by the sum times the initial velocity of mass 1, and you get the final velocity of mass 2 is twice the initial velocity of mass 1 divided by the total mass of the system. And uh, we can work that out in class. You can do it as a homework problem. But uh, it's not too bad. It's not too bad. All right. And finally, what happens if you go to two dimensions? Both of those examples were in one dimension. In two dimensions, let's say I have a mass m1 colliding with a mass m2, and they interact. Uh, the distance between the velocity vector and the center of mass 2 is sometimes called the impact parameter. Okay, that's just some terminology. And uh, if they collide with one another, what happens? They kind of move along. And I've got some dotted lines here that are supposed to represent their trajectories, not the detailed trajectory during the collision, but they are sort of the asymptotic directions of motion before and after the collision. Um, the angle, let's say we say the, 
angle of deflection of mass 1 is theta. The angle that mass 2's final velocity makes with the original direction of motion of mass 1, let's call it phi. And then we can uh, put in that the total momentum has to be the same, put in that the kinetic energy has to be the same, and we basically grind away. Now there are uh, some problems in the back of the book that relate to this system and oftentimes you'll be given theta or you'll be given phi or you'll be given uh, the initial velocity of the initial guy and you have to basically just fiddle with these equations until you can sort out the answer. The point is um, the momentum equation is a vector equation so that gives you one equation one scalar equation for each dimension in space. In other words the x components of the momenta have to add and equal each other before and after, the y components have to equal each other before and after, and the z components have to equal e each other before and after. The most we're going to do in this class is probably two-dimensional collision, in which case you just have two equations from the momentum conservation, the momentum, the fact that the momentum is unchanged, I should say, and uh, you get one scalar equation from the fact that the translational kinetic energy is unchanged, since this is a perfectly inelastic collision. And uh, basically, you just grind away on those three equations, and hopefully you only have three unknowns, and you can solve the thing. So that's the idea. Um, we're going to get work some examples in class, and also we'll have a lab this week dealing with collisions, so we can get some experimental evidence that this stuff actually works. And we'll see you there.